you get an amen from Atiba, you know you earned it. It's an affirmation that what has been just sung or spoken is absolutely truth. And so we take that. No matter the dream, no matter the vision, we take the energy of the song, we take the energy of the amen. Wherever you are, Atiba, we take it with us. There it is. All right. I got an all right. That's even better than an amen. <laughs> if I get a hallelujah, I'm going to faint over here, dire. Now, I, I don't know if that was a hallelujah for what I was about to say or the fact that I'm going to fall over dead now. <laughs> you know, I'm about to go on a sabbatical here. I'm going to talk about that. But he's saying hallelujah. Why, why is it taking you so long? Go for a couple of months. Oh, take a deep breath with me. And so it is. Every dream, every vision that you could ever desire exists in this now moment. All the good of your heart that you could ever want to have manifest in your life exists in this now moment. Breathe that in. Accept that for a minute. But I want to use this quote. You guys really liked my quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson last week. So I thought as a foundation of the house we're going to build today, let's start with good old Ralphie again. So let's put it up there. I've got the quote. Let's please read this together. What lies behind you and what lies in front pales in comparison to what lies inside you. I want you to hear clearly today that there's no place you can go where there's more of you to experience. That there's no experience or relationship or situation that you can go to where there is more of your God essence to experience than where you are right now. No matter the conditions of your life, the experiences of your current ex life experience, there is no more of your God, beautiful, light essence available. Breathe that in. As I contemplated that quote and thought about each and every one of you and the magnificence of your very soul, a story came to mind. It was the story of the gatekeeper. And he stood at the gates of the magnificent city. He was there to answer any questions they might have about the city. And one day, a gentleman came up and he says, I'm having to relocate. I'm thinking about your city. Tell me about the people that live here in this city. What kind of people are they? And the gatekeeper thought for a minute and says, Tell me about the people, what they were like in the city you came from. Oh, they were awful. They were terrible, they were rude, they were obnoxious, they were selfish. In every possible way, I am so glad to be rid of them. And the gatekeeper scratched his chin and thought for a minute and said, you know, you're probably going to find people very much the same in this city. And he said, well, I'm going somewhere else then. And he went away. Five minutes later, another man came to the gatekeeper and he says, you know, I'm having to relocate and I'm looking for a new place to live. Tell me, what are the people like in this city? And the gatekeeper thought for a moment again, and he said, well, tell me about the people in the city you came from. Oh, I miss them already. They are so beautiful and so kind and so compassionate and so generous. And the gatekeeper scratched his chin once again and said, well, you're probably going to find people in this city very much the same way. And he opened up the gates, and the man made himself at home. It's a trite, simple adage, but a boy, is it spiritually sound and true? Wherever you go, what is it? There you are. Wherever you go, there you go in your personality, in the fullness of your humanness, and in the magnificence of your divinity. Both are present at the point of view, and you cannot be separate from them. And when you go to a new landscape, a new territory, a new relationship, the lens that you are wearing, the glasses that you are wearing is going to determine exactly what kind of city it's going to be going to determine exactly the kind of experience you're going to have. And either we're dancing in our divinity, in the magnificence that is not subject to what's going on out here, or we're dancing in a lens based upon our judgments, our history, our preconceived notions, our core wounds. Anybody have any core wounds besides me? That's a pair of, I'm, I'm the only one? Oh, thank you, thank you. Welcome to my support group. The problem is most of the humanity is walking around from place to place looking for the new person to complete them, looking for the new situation, the new church, the new, the new job, the new car, the new house. And if you're wearing the same lenses, you're going to repeat over and over and over and over and over again the same drama. You're the, high, you're the producer, the director, got an amen. A producer, the director. The actor, the, the lead actor in your drama, and if you don't change the perspective on the inside, what's on the outside is going to have different faces, but it's going to be the same experience. Now, sometimes we need to move to a new location. 
Sometimes there's an abusive, difficult, painful environment where it is best to remove yourself. Get me clear there. But if you remove yourself from that painful, difficult situation and don't do the inner work that got you to that place, don't change the inner lens, guess what? Over here, eventually you're going to be in the abusive, difficult, painful, dark environment again. Because transformation is an inside job. Change is not necessarily an external reality. It is an internal reality. Everything that's held in mind, in heart, in spirit is being responded to out here. Transcendence must come first. I transcend the circumstance. And then one of two things will always happen. The circumstance will change. Or I will then be able to move to a new city with a new lens, with new eyes, with a new heart, with a new spirit. Marcel Proust, um, I, I have to pronounce it like a Frenchman, Marcel Proust. Um, this is what he has to say very clearly, a, a, a new thought concept. Please read it with me. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. You know, have you ever noticed that there are a lot of people in the human race that are like children in the back seat on a long trip? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? When are we going to get there? How much longer are we there yet? And the reality is we sometimes act like children on the spiritual path. I'm looking for enlightenment, perpetually looking for enlightenment out here. Where is the heaven on earth I hear about? Where is the heaven on earth that I've been hearing about and reading in scripture and hearing at Unity North? The heaven on earth is here. And unless you find it here, it doesn't matter where you go, you're going to be in a place of hell because it's an externally motivated situation. It's an externally motivated, motivated impetus to experience heaven on earth, and we're not going to get there. Are we there yet? Looking for enlightenment here and there and everywhere. The old story of the fish that have heard about the great thing called water. Water. And they swim north, south, east, west, up and down, looking for this great thing called water. And they get together in spiritual community. And they, they chant, Oh, water. Oh, water. The water is right where they are. In fact, they're made up of water. It reminds me of the, the ancient Hindu myth. Brahman was getting ready to create all of humanity. And he was talking to the lesser gods and said, where should we plant the divinity of humanity? Where should we put that? Hide it so they won't find it. And the lesser gods said, oh, put it at the center of the earth. Put the soul at the center of the earth. And Brahman says, no, human beings are... They will dig, and they will dig, and they will find the divinity there. But what about the tallest mountain, they said? No, human beings, they will go searching everywhere for that light. They'll go to the top of the mountain. How about the bottom of the sea? They'll never think to look there. And Brahman says, human beings will go looking. They're perpetually seeking. The human ego will find it at the bottom of the sea. And then Brahman had an idea. <gasps> Let's plant the divinity within them. They will never ever think to look there. But if you get to the rock bottom of every single spiritual path that's ever dotted the landscape of humanity, the divinity is within. Not just Hinduism, Christianity at its core. Mystical paths say, look within. The answers you seek are within, not on the mountain. The answers you seek are in your heart and in your soul and in your spirit, not at the bottom of the ocean, not in the next experience. Not in the next condition, not in the next relationship. I'm getting ready to go on a sabbatical. Many of you uh, have heard that and you're aware of that. Honestly speaking, I've gotten to some edges and some gates in my own life. And if I practice what I preach, a Sabbath is needed. Sabbatical, that's the root word, is Sabbath. And if I go, I'm going to be seeing some wonderful, beautiful places. I'm going to be going to Glacier National Park going to see Yellowstone, maybe go up to Canada and the beautiful mountains and rivers of Canada, going to see friends in Washington. And if I go on a vacation to delight my eyes, to delight my ears, to delight my taste buds, because that happens on vacation, doesn't it? I will have a momentary delightful experience in the external realm. But sabbatical, by its root, is a Sabbath. It is the place to go within. If I don't bring new eyes to that which is calling my, for my attention within my own soul, I will come back the same man and have the same circumstances at the end of this month. I will come back not refreshed in the same exact 
I don't want to say pit because it's not a pit because I'm paying attention. It could be a pit if I didn't. I will become back into the same rut, the same circular pattern that isn't working for me. And it has nothing to do with an external reality. Yes, it helps to go to Glacier National Park and to sit beneath a waterfall and go, yes, there is a God. But unless the waterfall is a road sign to point me to the waterfall of God essence within my soul, and I go, yes, there is a God that's not attached to the circumstance, I will come back to the same circumstance and fall back into the same trap. Now, I'm not the only human being that does that. We're on a perpetual hamster wheel. I've been spending some time with uh, the writings of Dr. Joe Dispenza. And he talks a lot about the perpetual hamster wheel. And it looks a little bit like this. We have a slide, please. I don't know if you can read that or not. Please, if you can, please read it with me. The same thoughts always lead to the same choices. And the same choices lead to the same behaviors. And the same behaviors lead to the same experiences. And the same experiences produce the same emotions. And these emotions drive the very same thoughts. And the circle perpetuates. The circle perpetuates. It doesn't matter where you go. The same thoughts brought into a new city will produce the same result. The same emotions going into the new city are going to produce the same result. You are the change that you seek. That's how powerful you are. The thoughts that you're holding in your thought, in your mind, the laboratory of your mind are so incredibly creative. You get to be, as the Latin people say, the pattern interruptus. I just made that up. <laughs> the pattern interruptus. If you don't like what life is showing you, if you don't like the way you're feeling on the inside, interrupt the pattern and the cycle of your thoughts, your emotions, your behaviors, your experiences, and stop the cycle. So when I go to Glacier National Park, it's going to be new external eyes. I've never been there, but it must be new internal eyes. You see, we keep life fresh. We keep the God awareness fresh. We keep the call to ministry fresh. We keep the spiritual path of being a human being, having a human experience fresh from the inside out, not the outside in. And if there is any part of your spiritual path that is attached to the outside in, you're leaving yourself set up for a place of suffering. It reminds me of the story. The man who was on a deserted island, he was there for years and years and years and years. And he finally got rescued. And the captain of the ship, as he was getting ready to load this man, who was elated and excited, back onto the ship to rescue him after 15 years in, on the island alone. He said, before we go, I noticed there's three huts up there on the hill. Three really beautifully uh, designed huts. Did you make those? Yes, I did. Oh, that's wonderful. What are those huts? Well, the one in the middle, that's where I live. That's my home. Oh, it's beautiful. What are the other ones? He said, the one on the left, that's the church I go to. That's the church I go to. But what's the one on the right? Oh, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> the people there are terrible and awful. You know what? You can go. Have you ever done this? You go to a new job, and you've got it's excitement, and then a month in, two months in, the people are showing up exactly the same. I remember you from the last five jobs I had. Wherever you go, there you are. Bring a new heart, bring new beginner's mind, the Buddhists say. Use a beginner's mind, beginner's eyes, beginner's ears, and that look starts within. See yourself anew. Define yourself anew. Or, in, in a few moments, you're going to be back to the same person you always were. We shared in first service today, it's, uh, family is sometimes the place to go discover if you've really grown or not. The old adage, I can go home and visit my family. And within three days, little Richie is coming up. <laughs> it takes about three days for, that's what they call me. And they still call me Richie. Do not repeat that. <laughs> but Richie had a certain way of doing life. A certain view of himself. A certain way of relating to parents. And it takes three days for me to go unconscious and go, uh-oh, Richie's back. Richie's home. I have to mentally prepare to have new eyes when I go meet my parents who are fantastic, beautiful, wonderful people. And not that I don't fall. It has nothing to do with them. They're actually the same environment that I grew up in. If I don't change the environment of how I am coming into the situation, Richie comes. 
I'm no longer that person. Sometimes I'm Dick. I'm going to pay for that one. You know, there's a song, a John Mayer song, that I really love. It's on my phone. I love to listen to it, and I finally listen to the lyrics. There's a whole generation of people singing, waiting, waiting on the world to change. We keep waiting, waiting on the world to change. Wow. Why don't you be the change? I don't want to listen to that phone, that, that song on my phone anymore. It's talking about how life has been so terrible, how a whole generation is just waiting for things to change. If you're waiting in the world to change, you're going to perpetually get to your grave in a place of suffering, waiting for somebody else, waiting for the perpetual Messiah, the, the, the great Messiah to come and rescue me from my thinking. The Messiah to come and to rescue me from the hamster wheel of my emotions and my experiences. The Messiah has come and you're it. We've met the, Pogo said, we've met the enemy. It is us. You don't like what life's showing you. Take charge of your life. Grab the reins and make a difference by having new eyes. First, by standing in front of the mirror and going, Richie doesn't live here anymore. Richie doesn't live here anymore. Neither does Dick. It's Richard the Lionhearted. Spiritually, here's a spiritual truth, foundational to everything we teach. There is nothing more to look for. Everything you are seeking in your life, every dream and vision, you are. And was implanted in you the minute you showed up on the, the, plant, the, the planet here at Earth. It was implanted in you. You have to go within to find it. The answers are not out here. The answers are within. We are the peace that we seek. We are the love that we seek. We are the relationship that we seek. We need to develop the inner eyes that transcend the human experience, and then transformation can happen. Here's what Joe Dispenza has to say. That's a uh, next quote, please. Here we go. Let's read this together. Can you accept the notion that once you change your internal state, you don't need the external world to provide you with a reason to feel joy, gratitude, appreciation, or any other elevated emotion. First service, I talked about a quote I shared from Frederick Nietzsche. Nietzsche. He said, and those that saw the dance, thought, called those who were dancing crazy because they could not hear the music. You don't need permission to be joyful. And is it possible on your path, your human experience, to be in the place of bliss and peace when the world's falling apart? I got one amen. Is it possible to be in the place of utter joy, of gratitude and appreciation, even if it feels like hell out here? Yes. yes, you've now grabbed the reins. You've now grabbed control of your thinking, your feeling, your spirit, and your experience. Is it possible in the midst of loss, in the midst of a diagnosis, in the midst of a bro broken relationship, in the midst of any human experience, to be the veritable presence of God and be so grounded and centered in who you are that nothing can affect that inner calm and that inner place? Yes, it is absolutely possible because we live in a quantum reality, a quantum interconnected reality. And that quantum reality cares a heck of a lot less about what you desire and a heck of a lot more about who you are. The radiating center of who you are, this quantum world, is responding to you, to who you are being. And so we quit asking the question, where is the next destination? Why is this happening? And we get to the place of the most profound question, who am I? I am the veritable presence of God and nothing can shake that inmost calm. Nothing can shake the experience of oneness with this SOB in front of me. No. <laughs> Nothing can shake, no matter what is in front of me. That was not for you, Francisco. I'm so <laughs> <laughs> Nothing can shake me from knowing the truth of my divine essence, but I must have the eyes to stand before the altar of God in its disguises, its thousands of disguises, and behold the face of the Christ, of the Buddha, of the Atman. And the most difficult place to do that, and this is your homework for the week, is to stand in the mirror and look at yourself differently. Let go of the lenses of your past, 
your past hurts, your wounds, your core belief systems. Everything be be before that moment does not and will not define you. And don't worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. Stand in front of the mirror and go, it is good. Take the Sabbath. It is good and it is very good. And then watch the monkey mind that goes, oh, yeah, but there's those extra pounds that you need to get rid of. You know, go ahead. Uh, I think that uh, most people, who was it that said this? Carlton Pearson. That we're all afraid to go into the bathroom. We put a towel around ourselves. We put clothes on because we're afraid to look at our magnificence. I want you to stand naked in front of the mirror and then transcend what it looks like physically and to stand emotionally, spiritually, mentally naked and go, here I am. Hmm. In my rich, richiness, in my Richard the Lionheartedness, in my dickness. <laughs> it's all a part of who I am. And if I don't like what I see, let me change the inside world first before it changes on the outside. Ava's over here. She's just taking notes over here going, don't ever say that in ministry. How many people are looking for the new relationship to complete them? And I tell you, here in Cobb County, I have pe people that go from church to church to church to church looking for the answers. And they will never, ever find the answers outside themselves. Where you sit today, the answers lie within you. Because we keep life, God, and ourselves fresh from the inside out, not the outside in. Now, here's a very profound quote from a very deep thinker. Let's put the next quote up there, please. I think his name is Richard the Lionhearted. I don't know if you can read it, but this is a truth, a spiritual truth that I hope you get today. Together, wherever you are, wherever you go, whomever you're with, you are the one you are experiencing. You are the one that you are experiencing. So the judgment thrown out is a judgment of self. The love thrown out is a love of self. That's a wheel I want to play on. The kindness thrown out is the kindness received. The condemnation thrown out is the condemnation received. Everything outside of you is illusory. Everything outside of you is transitory and is of no consequence unless you have a clear concept of you in relationship to it. The difficult person, the difficult situation, the magnificent situation, it's all about who you are in relationship to this. Don't give the power away. Return home. So here's your homework. When you, got out, when you get out of here today and you sit in that car, I want you, how many remember the first time you got behind the wheel of a car as a teenager? Freedom! <laughs> Freedom and excitement and power! Now we get in the car and it's like, uh, I want you to put the beginner's eyes on and go, I have a car. I'm blessed. I can get from here to here. I am blessed. I can drive this car anywhere I want. Unless I hit Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> then I've got air conditioning in the car. Get behind the wheel of your life. Get behind the vehicle that is your very existence and grab the wheel with the same teenager excitement that you had when you were 17 years old. And to know that's how powerful you are. That's how incredibly powerful you are. And quit waiting around for somebody else to change the world. Look at life with fresh eyes. And I'm going to leave you with a final quote before we go into meditation. It is from Betty Smith, who wrote the book, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Let's read this together. Look at everything as though you are seeing it either for the first or last time. And your time on earth will be filled with glory. It is my hope, it is my desire, it is my dream that as I go away for a month and develop the eyes of my heart to confront the gates, the old cities, the new cities, and the ones that I will be in, that you do the same thing. I have very, very purposely brought speakers in to share with you, not by accident, but by a divine appointment. And I'm going to invite you to make every effort to be here to embrace them because they bring profound, profound teachings to open the eyes of your heart to see that no matter who is speaking, no matter who is singing, no matter who is sitting next to you, no matter what workshop or class you happen to be in, 
It is you having a relationship with the presence of God doing business as you at the end of the day. Get behind the wheel of your car. Open the eyes of your heart and let love, let love have its way with you and your life will be filled with more glory than you could ever, ever, ever imagine. Take a deep breath. We're going to use a song to go into our time of meditation. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. And I'm going to pull a fast one on the singers and all of you. I want more of an affirmation than what this is. Let's put the word I. I open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I'm making a statement of who I am going to be from this moment on. I open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. I want to see your glory. I want to see your magnificence. I want to live and breathe and have my expression as your light. Together we sing.